touching his lips with the coal from the altar. Now that's the altar of incense that's right in front of the Holy of Holies. So Isaiah is looking into the glory. Amen. If you go to Ezekiel, the cherubim, they're throwing those coals all over the earth. All right. Amen. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, see, that's the point that I, that's why I'm getting excited. Because when the angel touches Isaiah's lips, he said, the Lord says, Yahweh says, who can we send who understands the message? And Isaiah says, the Lord sent me. He says, go tell my people to see me, do not see me, do not hear. They don't have eyes to see, ears to hear the mysteries of the kingdom. It's the same thing Jesus, when the disciples said, Jesus, why are you teaching the people in parables, symbolisms? Jesus said, because the mysteries of the kingdom are in the parables. And if you want to understand the kingdom and the language of the kingdom, it's hidden in the symbolism. He said, and then he goes on and says, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear. He quotes Isaiah. Amen. And, and Isaiah goes on and says, these people, they don't have eyes to see. Uh, uh, their eyes have closed. That word closed in the Greek means they close to the mysteries. And he says, and their hearts have waxed gross. It means they've grown fat on their hearts, or their hearts need to be circumcised as proof of being in the covenant. Yes, amen. Amen. It's the circumcision of the heart. And he said, for if they had eyes and seniors to hear, hear, he said, I would heal them. Or and they would re, you know, return to me, I would heal them. That word return means to be converted. Maybe they would be converted through the revelation. And then the Lord said, I would heal them. That word healing means to bring to the fullness of your salvation. That means to bring you back into your glorified life. It's just not healing. It's bringing back into the glory. So here's Jesus himself saying, if the people will learn the secrets, I'll heal them. Oh. And so when I know when I preach, because I've seen it happen so many times, I've seen lame, I've seen legs, uh, twisted legs restore a lady with a club foot, her foot popped right back out. I had a guy over in, in California, his legs were burned, the skin was burned off his legs, he came in for prayer. And in three days, the skin grew back on his legs. Hallelujah. It was burned off in an industrial fire the night before the service. I've seen those kind of miracles. But it's all come through revelation. So I know we, we move with what the Holy Spirit is saying and doing. Yes. Hallelujah. We're going to see those, those miracles again even to a greater dimension. Amen. I like everything before. But, but what, what I've seen was when this scripture was given to me, hallelujah, is the end of this chapter. Meaning the Lord in Ezekiel says, I'm going to pour these coals out over the whole earth. I'm going to pour the secrets of the kingdom out over the whole earth to get you ready to come into the Holy of Holies. The high priest could not come into the Holy of Holies without that, all, without that coal because he would put it in the censer, put the, put the uh, incense on it, and before him would go the cloud as he would come into the glory to protect him, hallelujah, as he would come into the glory. Meaning that everything was based on that coal that you could come back into the glory. It's the same way with the revelation. Everything in that revelation had happened to release the fullness of the glory. That's why there was the wise and the foolish. Amen. But in Isaiah, to make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, at least they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return to be healed. There it is. He said, that eyes and ears to hear, I will heal them. Then I said, Lord, how long? So Isaiah is saying, how long is this going to take till you start doing this to give people eyes to see and ears to hear? And the Lord answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitants, and the houses are without a man, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord is saying, I'm going to let everything come into a desolation. Amen. Everything that is dead. Amen? And, and Paul says that he quotes, he quotes Joel, where he says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And we use that as a salvation scripture, and it's not. Paul is quoting Joel, and if you read real close to what Joel was saying, what Paul was saying, it's talking to saints that have already given their heart to God. It's not people that are coming in, it's people that are already in, and they're crying out, Lord, save us. Man. And it hit me when I was reading that, so you've got to come to a place to realize we're in a state of desolation, that something is wrong, and you're saying, Lord, save me from this dead religious system. Yes. Yeah. Amen. But if we're going to keep playing kumbaya, and we're going to keep saying things are blessed when they're really cursed, That's right. Go ahead. we're on. not going to believe what God's word says to us and pointing out our fault. <laughs> and then the Lord says, well, then you got what's coming to you. Because you don't want to change. Because really, the Lord says, 
God's word says, here's the covenant, here's the statute, it's happening to you, and yet you're saying it's not, and you're calling me a liar. Wow. Hello? That's the fact. Amen? The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Amen? But yet, a tenth will be in it. This is the scripture I was given. And yet a tenth will be in it, and will return, and be for consuming as a temperate, as a temperate tree, and an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. Amen. So here you hear the, see the Lord say, when everything is desolate, everything has been removed, he said, I still got a tenth. I still have an offering. Mm -hmm. And that offering is my remnant. There you go. There. My remnant will remain, hallelujah, for this last move. And through that tent, hallelujah, I'm going to bring the restoration of everything. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. Amen. So you might say, well, why are my friends here? Why maybe they're not part of the tent? Mm. Hallelujah. Maybe they're part of the next season. But right now, the Lord is raising up the tent. The first fruits, the scripture calls it. Hmm. The first fruits that comes before the rest of the offering. In order to prepare them for this next season. Can I get an amen? amen. You see, Jesus took out 12 men. Those were his 12 apostles. But those 12 men turned up the rest of the church. That's right. Can I, can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. Amen. How many was in the upper room? 12. 120. Yeah. How many did he first choose? 12 to the 10th of 120. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Can I get an amen? Wow. wow. So the Lord does it in patterns. He does it all the time. Wow. We need to understand those patterns. Amen. Wow. Because with the Lord, the Lord really doesn't do nothing new. When he, he says, I'm going to do a new thing, it's, it's not new to Him. And it's not, it's not that it's already hasn't been done. It's just so we don't understand and it's new to us. When it's released, amen? amen. So he's bringing that new release to us. So, hallelujah. I want to. I'm going to just do a quick. Again, I want to show you just a little pattern here. Um, one day I was in the Book of Revelations, and the Lord talked about the, the tree of life at the end of the Book of Revelation. Does anybody remember how many fruits it has? Twelve. Twelve fruits. So the tree has twelve fruits. So the pattern must stay the same through the Scripture. Hmm. Yes. Right? Amen. See, this is what I mean by understanding typology and symbolisms. Because they always remain the same. They don't change. But how many fruits of the Spirit do we have? Nine. Something's wrong. We're missing three. Yeah. Hmm. That's the first thing the Lord said to me. We're, you're missing three of the fruit. Yet you can go almost into any church, and they will tell you there's only nine fruit of the Spirit. Well, if you only get nine, and you're supposed to have twelve, you're in trouble. See, that's a deception, again, that we need, we need to understand that something's not there, something is wrong. Hallelujah. So I did this teaching a while back. I'm sorry you can't see it. Because it's, <laughs> boy, come up and sit in the yeah. <laughs> but Jesus, I'm going to give you the scriptures, Luke 8, 11. The parable is this, the seed is the word, and there's the word for seed right there. So what is the seed? It is the word. So I put a little arrow down here and I got the word for word. And the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning. So the seed is the word and the word is God. So, hallelujah, we take a look at it. There you go. The word is God. So if the seed is the word and the word is God, that means God is the seed. Come on. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Now, there's not a script. There might be a scripture. I, don't, I haven't read across it yet that says God's a seed. I, I, don't, I don't see that. But it's like you're saying, you know, the baby, uh, the, the, the baby is in the car, right? Wait a minute. <laughs> the baby seat is in the car, huh. and the baby is in the baby seat. So where's the baby? In the car. It's in the car. And see, the scripture has many... Uh, metaphors that way that you've got to search it out to understand it in a deeper way. That's right. And this might be simple to you or seem simple to you, but it, it gets deeper. So the seed is the word, the word is God, according to Scripture. And 
it says that God is light in 1 John 1 5. So God is light. So the light is also the seed. Amen? Amen? Hmm. So, and the seed, who is Christ? Galatians 3 16. So the seed is also Christ. So Christ is God. Christ is the seed. Christ is the Word. Amen. And so the pattern is all there from Scripture. The Word is light. According to Philippians 2.16, hold fast to the word of life. So the word is life. So life is Christ. Life is the light. Life is God. Life is the word. God is love. Hallelujah. He who does not, uh, uh, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 1 John 4, 8. Now, if God is love, and God is Christ, and God is the seed, and God is life, and the seed is God, that means love is the seed also. There you go. Yes, amen. So you cannot say, well, God is love, and I don't need to know the word of God. Uh-huh. Mm. Mm. Uh-huh. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It all is a beautiful pattern that the Lord lays down for us. Amen. Because we know that the scripture says that the fruit of the Spirit is love. So fruit is all these other things. So when we look at light, we look at these words, they're, they're giving us a pattern of something much greater than when we look into the Old Testament and into the New Testament, God is saying something to us. Because the light also, 1 John says, God is light and in him there's no darkness. If we walk in the light, amen, as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, washes us of our sins. But how do you get washed of your sins? By being in the light. Mm -hmm. What's the light? It's the word. It's the revelation of the word. So you cannot say, well, I just plead the blood and be ignorant out here. That's right. Somebody hearing what I'm saying? That's right. The blood is revelation that washes us. The blood will protect you. There's a blood covenant with you and the Lord. But that covenant is expanded and expanded through the revelation of his word. Amen? So hallelujah. So we look. And there's so many patterns. There's the sons of God, the sons of Satan. There's the law of life, the law of sin and death. For everything that there is, there's an opposite. The God of heaven, the God of this world, the God of light, the God of darkness. See, every one of these things has an anti. There's the Christ, there's the Antichrist. Hallelujah, there's life, there's death. There's love, there's hate. And so when you begin to look at all the patterns, you begin to see it. Amen? And, and we begin to understand that process as we move deeper in to the revelation of the secret of the kingdom. But let me take you, because I said something earlier about the fruits of the Spirit. That, you know, we are continually taught that there's only nine fruit of the Spirit. But when we take a look at what the Scripture says, hallelujah. I don't want to go through all that. Righteousness and 
truth. And then in Hebrews, Paul again. Hebrews 13, 50. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to, uh, thanks to his name. So the twelfth fruit of the Spirit is praise. Wow. Yes. So we go from 9 to 12 just by searching out what Paul says. So love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, hallelujah, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, righteousness. These are the three. Righteousness, truth, and praise. If we just take a look at Ephesians 5, 9 and Hebrews 13, 15. Why is it so important? Long-suffering. Hallelujah. Long-suffering doesn't mean you've been suffering a long time. <laughs> Amen. Long-suffering means patience, endurance, consistency, steadfastness, perseverance, slowness, and avenging wrongs. Meaning when somebody does, we need a lot of, we need long-suffering in the body of Christ. Because a lot of us want to act when somebody does something to us instead of having the nature of Christ and just forgiving and letting that go. That's a major fruit right there that we need to get a hold of. Amen? Amen? Amen. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Goodness literally means uprightness of our heart or God's going to describe His word in your heart. Gentleness, hallelujah, is usefulness. Amen? Excellence in character. And, and uh, when God calls you to do something, you get it done. So it's not like I'm a gentle person and, and, and the Greek would sort of lose some of this understanding. Virtue, self-control, virtue, amen. Those that are mature in their understanding, and we know that those that are mature understand it. They're deeper revelation of the word. So, those fruits, when we take a look, here's this whole line of thing that goes from, from love, I'm sorry, the other slide goes from love all the way down, or it goes from the word, or the seed, to love. Right. You know, you realize we started with the seed, and we ended in love. What's the seed? The sperm of the word. That's right. So ultimately, you come into a love-making process. Oh, my God. And through the end of that love-making process, you begin to bear children. Mm. <laughs> Those children are the fruit of the spirits. Yes. You see that? Yes. Hallelujah. It's a deeper revelation than just saying, well, you know, before I used to think, well, I've got to work on my love. i got to work on my self-control. Yeah. i got to become more patient. That doesn't work. There has to be an engrafted word that changes you from the inside out. And that comes with the revelation. You'll see it more and more in your life. But the bad thing is, is when revelation comes, also tribulation comes. Yeah, come on. Amen? Jesus said in the parable of the sower, he said, uh, he said, he was talking about how the seed is cast in different places. And he talked about the foul the air coming and still in the seed and, and the seed on the wayside and seed, you know, on hard rock and this and that. And Jesus went on to say, because, because when the seed comes, he said, trials and tribulations come because of the word seed. Yeah. So when the seed is released, what's it bring? Tribulation. Why is there tribulation? Because literally one, the word anointing means to squeeze or press in the oil. The oil is what? Symbolic of what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what? The teacher and the counselor. So what's God squeezing into you? His te the teaching, his word. So he's engrafting the word into you. Right. So you've got to expect the tribulation to come. The tribulation is when somebody attack you. It's God pressing the oil, squeezing the oil into you so that the oil becomes part of you. Right. Right. Antichrist means I'm rejecting the pressure. I don't want this oil squeeze in me. I don't want to learn. I don't want to listen. And because of that, I'm, I'm fighting with the Holy Spirit. Mm. And if you fight Him, you're a lost cause. Yes. Yeah. Because the only sin that cannot be forgiven is, the, 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 is blasphemy yeah. of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy is not swearing, cussing, or, or something like that. If you start studying and researching blasphemy, it means I'm taking the Holy Spirit of no account, no effect, no nothing. I'm not taking Him seriously. And if He's the teacher and the counselor, and He is supposed to transform me, and I'm rejecting the teaching of the Holy Ghost, oh. I cannot be saved. Amen. And, and here's the scary part. I can receive the teachings of men oh. Oh my God. as a counterfeit to the Holy Ghost. Oh Amen. Yeah. And if I, if I receive 
heresy, carnal teaching. There, yeah. It's the Holy Ghost teaching. No. Come on. Amen. Paul said, I did not come to you, first Corinthians 2, with natural wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of Christ. And my speech and preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power, so that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, I speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age that are coming to nothing. I speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Amen. So he said, babies, carnal people, have you that wisdom? So Paul said, there's two wisdoms. There's the wisdom of man and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And then, you know, first one things, what he goes on to say, for the Spirit searches all things. He goes, I did not come to you with the wisdom of man, yes. right? right? With the declaration of this understanding. My speech, my preaching were not with the persuasive words of the human wisdom, but the demonstration of the Spirit. Power that your faith will not be in the wisdom of men, but the power of God, however I speak to them, they're mature. Perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this age, or the rules of this age, they're coming to nothing. I speak, I speak, I speak to them. I speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the wisdom of God is in a mystery. Mm -hmm. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Right. He ordained the secrets to bring us back into the glory. Amen. So if we're going to learn, I'm going to come back into the glory. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Which another day ages not made known to the sons of men. Amen. And he goes on to say, but these things have been now revealed by his spirit. I mean, he goes on to say, uh, he goes on to say, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Right. He says, I have not seen, there's not heard, but the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So what does the Holy Spirit search out? The deep things. The, deep things. Yes. 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 the Holy Spirit searches out the deeper teachings. Yes. That word deep in the Greek also means the reveal mysteries. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Amen. It, it literally means like a sonar that's in a submarine that goes out in the depths of the ocean and it hits something and it brings back a reflection. Ah. Yeah. It's the sonar of the Holy Ghost that goes out in the heart of God and brings back a reflection. Oh, man. Uh -huh. We see it in a mirror dimly. Uh. Amen. So we begin to see the deeper teachings of the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things out, yes, the deep things of God. So the Holy Spirit teaches what? Deep things. That's right. Come on. So you can't say I have the Holy Ghost and don't understand deep things. Come on. Right. He's not teaching the Bible of face value. He's teaching the depths of the Scripture. Yes, amen. Amen. So the Holy Spirit, if you breathe, you're not going to be able to learn the depths of the Scripture. Come on. Amen. And that's the only sin that cannot be forgiven. Because the forgiveness comes through the revelation of God's word. Can you see that? So the Holy Spirit is searching out these deep things and revealing these deep things to us. And these deeper understandings. And that's his job to release those things. If we grieve the Holy Spirit, mm. then he's not going to release it to us. And then if he doesn't release the deeper things to us, Paul says we can't come into the glory. Oh my God. For the Spirit said right before that, he goes, for the seeds, he goes, it's been ordained from the foundation of the Lord for those things that are in the of the glory. I don't know how we miss it. It's Paul's very clear. He says, it is ordained from the foundation of the world that these mysteries would bring us back into the glory. But we're going to fly away and get jets and fly out and space shuttles. <laughs> and, and Paul says, the secrets. It's the mysteries that were taught to the early church. It is the teaching of the Holy Ghost. So if you're not being taught deeper things, you're learning the wisdom of men. Mm. Mm. You know how many theologians I've run across? Mm. Lots of them. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> you know how many theologians have come to me and said to me things like, you know, the Lord told me if I was going to be used in the next move, I had to lay down my theology. Oh, my wow. God. You know how many theologians have told me that? Wow. That are moving in the Spirit. Who begin moving in signs, wonders, and miracles. I mean, heaps of those guys have come to me. And the Lord has said to every one of them, you've got to throw away your doctrine. Wow. He said, you can't be part of this. Now, why would God tell a person that's supposed to be educated in the Bible that he can't be used in the next move in doing because of his education? Mm. My God. Wow. That should not contradict that he 
it should inflate it. Because I know more revelation I teach, the greater miracles I see. Amen? So, so in reality, in the release of what the Lord is releasing to us, he's, he's talking to us. He's just not trying to impress us. Amen? Since you're going to, God's not trying to impress you. Of course he does, but he's not really doing that. The, the letter P, P-E-Y in the Hebrew alphabet, it literally means a tooth. Amen? And it literally, when I started seeing people getting gold teeth, the Lord was saying something. The word pay also means a revelation of the secrets. Amen. Uh, gold is wisdom. That's right. So when the Lord gave you a gold tooth, he's telling you, I'm going to release to you the secrets of the kingdom. Wow. I'm anointing your mouth to speak it. So it's a sign of an anointing and a placement that's on your life for something greater. Much greater. That's right. It's the redemption of all the church. That's right. Because when we come back into the glory, we're going to be redeemed. That's right. Come we have in, in front of Europe, we have over 5,000 documented cases of people getting gold teeth. Diamonds falling out of the air. Yeah. Miracle sign, gold breaking out on people. Come on. Uh, it, it, it's, it's manifesting again. We just were last last time these were over and Victor go, a lot of the people had to go on. But yeah. why? The Lord is he kicking dust off the streets in heaven and uh -huh. kicking the gold <laughs> dust off the streets and, and hitting us? No. He's telling us I'm, he, my streets are made out of gold. My streets are made out of wisdom. No, if you're gonna, well, the early church called themselves away and they were walking out wisdom. Yeah. The yeah. word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a guide unto my path. The lamp, the light, the revelation shows me the golden path I should be taking. Hallelujah. 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 Taking us down some new paths. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to uh, quickly, I'm not going to spend much time. In this, really? Uh, yeah, really. Amen, really yeah. <laughs> spend time, please. Amen. I, I can do this quickly. Oh, my gosh. We're going to talk about stewardship. Because hmm. I hear it all the time, you're going to be a good story of your money. Yeah. That's true and it's false. That's right. At the same time. Because there's a different finance in the kingdom right. than Come worldly on. finance. But again, in man's natural wisdom will take that and run with it, not understanding that there's another stewardship the Lord's talking about. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. You use the, the definition of the word prophet here. Hallelujah. We take a look at this. This is uh it's a noun prophetia signifies the speaking forth of the mind and counsel of God. And what's the word counsel come from? Holy Spirit. I heard somebody say it. So, secrets. What's the secrets? The sowed of God. It's God's counsel. We went over that last night. Amen? So the prophets, what do they speak? God's counsel or his secrets. Jesus is the teacher and the counselor. The Holy Spirit is the teacher and the counselor. What's the counselor? One that teaches secrets. Amen? But because we don't understand the Hebrew where it came from, we miss it. Amen? Femi, to speak, the prophet, amen, through much, uh, through much of the Old Testament prophecy was purely uh, uh, predictive. See Micah 5.2. John 11.51. Prophecy is not necessary, nor even primary foretelling. It is a declaration of that which cannot be known by natural means. Many of your natural mind cannot understand what God's getting ready to do. Man will never understand what God's getting ready to do. But if the Holy Spirit is in you, through the spirit of prophecy, God will tell you what he's getting ready to do. Yes, amen. Come on, amen. How is it that most of us in this room know God's getting ready to move? Because the Holy Spirit's been telling you. But you can go down to churches all around here. For every one of us, there's a hundred other ones that do not have a clue what God's getting ready to do. It's because the Holy Spirit is the same out there to them. Yet they pray in the name of Jesus. They read the Bible. They give scripture. They God is speaking to them. And all why? They breathe the Holy Ghost. Come on. Amen. Amen. The spirit of Antichrist. Yeah. And the Lord is dealing with it. Amen. Amen. It is the fourth 
foretelling beforehand, the foretelling of the will of God, whether with reference to the past, present, or future. Amen? So, well, this effective upon unbelievers was to show that the secrets of men's heart would be made known to God to convict of sin and to constrain to worship. Hallelujah. When we look at Colossians 14.3, it is to reveal the secrets of the heart. The, what does that mean? See, we think the spirit prophecies that come to tell us, tell on people. <laughs> you were doing this last night. You did that. It's not what that's for. No. I mean, how many times? God will come and the Lord will come and tell you something. He never really, He'll always do it in love. That's right. Amen. Even when the woman was caught in adultery. That's right. Jesus did not condemn her. Hallelujah. So, so what is the, what, why does the Lord want to tell you what's the secrets of your heart? Because if He's putting secrets and revelation in you, where's He writing it? I'm going to write my Torah in your heart, your soul, and in your mind. So when he inscribes his will into your heart, and you begin to get the revelation, that will of God begins to come out of you. That was once a secret, now becomes a manifestation of the glory and the power of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Uh, and some of you have been going down a road that you really don't, you, you know God was going to do something, you didn't know what it was. I guarantee you, if you study, if you say that's will of the prophet, the little first show you everything he's getting ready to do. And all of a sudden, just start coming out of you. You'll be like, oh my God, I didn't think the Lord talked to me like that. And you'll, you'll, be, you'll be realizing this is increasing on you. You feel like the Lord's increasing upon you? Yes, I do. It's because the more revelation goes in, the more seeds planted, the fruit of that has to come out. And so it, it, it's a constant position in the kingdom where you're hearing God speak to you. Amen. It's all because you're putting the seed in. Amen. Amen. To know the mind of God. Hallelujah. The message of the prophet was the direct revelation of the mind of God. So he, God's bringing that revelation. But what's the conviction of sin? Sin in the Old Testament is the ignorance of God's word. So if I don't know what God's doing, I'm living in sin. Come on. Because God wants to speak out of me and through me. Sin isn't like cheating, stealing. That's not sin. Sin is I don't know what God's getting ready to do. You know why? There's no seed in me. Mm. If I don't have no seed, I can't have fruit. Because all fruit starts with the seed first. See, some of you want this revelation all right now. You want the revelation of Jesus. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's unveiling himself to us. Why? To, to so we're in that constant walking communion with the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So, but that's the word for prophet. I'm not going to get into all those definitions right now. John 9.39. And Jesus said. For judgment has come into this world that those who do not see may see. What was judgment for? To give people eyes to see. The yeah. deeper teachings of the kingdom. Jesus, why are you teaching in parables? Because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear. So he's trying to give us the eyes to see. So judgment started as soon as revelation started being released. Hallelujah. I read that to you out of Plus, plus the Bible dictionary last night. I will come into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may not may be blind. What did Jesus call the Pharisees? Blind guys. What was the judgment? He was teaching the secrets of the kingdom and the mysteries, the parables. They couldn't see it. So what did he call them? Blind guys. He said, if you can't see the secrets, you're a blind guy. What's a guy? Somebody that's leading somebody else. And so Jesus said, do not follow a blind guy or somebody that can't understand the secrets of the kingdom because he will lead you into the pit. What's the pit? Revelation is the bottomless pit. No. It's where Abaddon comes out and it's a place with the word bottomless means a place where there's no secrets. No revelation. No revelation. So we're blind guys. People in churches that do not have revelation. They might be great, wonderful people, very nice. Living what we call a godly life. But God doesn't choose those people. God chooses the, the maniacs. He chooses people like David that are fornicators, that were, that were killing people's husbands. He chooses people that are seeking him, trying to get an interchange instead of outer manifestation. And God's not even in that. If you change yourself, Seeking the Spirit of God. And you're seeking 
need the Holy Spirit to change you, to give you the fruit of God's nature, and you understand the process. Then you're letting God be God in your life. You see the difference? So we need to understand that. I, 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 and this is a problem. This is a massive problem. So I've had people come into me, and our ministry people would say to me, you know, Pastor, you know, I'm gay. Okay. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not, I, I am, what do, they, what do they say? I'm a, what do, yeah, I'm a happy person. Yeah. <laughs> Way to go, Donna. I'm very happy. But, let's see, you know, I'm, but I'm still struggling with this. I'm not practicing it, but I'm still struggling with it. And see, what we do not understand is what Jesus said. He said, if a man lusts after a woman, it's the same as committing adultery. Meaning there's not been an interchange. It's just the guy saw chasing women, but there's never been an inner manifestation and a cleansing through the Holy Spirit to put the fruit of Christ in him or that her to, to deal with that. And so, in a lot of churches, they see, well, you have to be abstinent. And abstinence is good, but if there's no deliverance. There you go. Right. There you go. And that person isn't being set free. They're still fighting with that spirit. Right. Come on. So you, you can say whatever you want to me to gay people as a lifestyle. That they're born that way. They don't have enough genes. Their mind is in another place. You can give me all the medical reasons, but I've cast demons out of those people. And they lose that spirit.
And I was like, oh man, I cannot believe this. And, and next thing I know, I'm looking into their hearts. Yes, there you go. And I see the battle and the struggle. They want free. They want to be delivered from that. They want to know God just like we want to know God. There's a heart and a desire of God. Some of them were speaking in tongues. Can you believe it? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Because I was in the assemblies and the assemblies taught us too. If you were baptized in the Spirit, you couldn't have a demon, Maria. Oh, yeah, right. Amen. Remember that? And how can you not have a demon if you're gay? That's right. Come on. So my whole theology was just bouncing off my head back and forth, trying to figure out this whole thing. And I'm like, okay, Lord, okay, what do we do? What's he going to deliver? So I started, and this was crazy because at the time, too, the Lord's, you know, I was trying to get people delivered. There would be some deliverance, but there wasn't a lot of deliverance and all this stuff. And I started taking the people into the revelation of the Lord, the secrets of the kingdom. And those people that were living gay lifestyles were being set free like that. Being set free. Then I see, oh, oh, this is the key to unlock this inner problem, these inner spirits, and set them free. And help them be more consistent in their walk. And then I realized, man, you know what I thought? I said, I'm the problem. I was the problem. There you go. I not only was I the problem, I'm the problem with the whole church has right now. I'm just a reflection. Somebody else's theology. There you go. That did not have an answer. Amen. I said, Lord, I repent. I'm sorry. I forgive me. Yes. For, yes. for listening to man and not listening to you. Amen. And then all of a sudden, I started liking gay people coming here to my church. Because <laughs> they get these done. So Jesus said, if you have the ability to say we're blind, we don't see what you're talking about, then you don't have 
not sin in you. But because you said we do see, we do understand the scripture, now sin is in you. Sin is not based upon acts that we do. Sin is based upon our understanding of scripture. Uh -huh. That's amazing. That's that is amazing. amazing. Because that's another big problem. You gotta quit doing this, you gotta quit doing that, quit, 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 quit this. And all we're doing is putting people in cupboards instead of setting them free. Maybe we should start saying, we need to learn deliverance. We need to learn how to set people free. We need to learn the mysteries of the kingdom. So when people come in, they're going to be set free by the anointing that's upon our lives. Yeah. And don't tell me that that's not the issue. Because I, I, when I was a little kid, my dad, I used to say, I know when Mrs. Coleman comes in the room. I can feel her presence. And Mrs. Coleman would sneak into all the conference, all the meetings. <laughs> Amen. She would just, they'd be going to worship, and she would come out, and she'd be dancing across the platform. With her big old ball gown on, she looked like the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Just moving across the platform. Swooping. My dad, he thought, man, my dad <laughs> come out of the Roman Catholic, he come out of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. Yeah. My dad didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So my dad said, he goes, so you know when she come to the room? I said, yeah, I can feel it. And he goes, okay. My dad made me all through worship. He turned me around, made me face him. So you tell me when she comes in the room. It's okay. Because Mrs. Coleman in, real quiet, she's here, Dad. Wow. My dad was stunned. So for like two months, I had to stand in front of my dad <laughs> with my back turned to the stage. Uh, and I had to tell him every time Mrs. Coleman came into the room. And you know what? For two months, man, I was just sitting there. <laughs> My dad would just sit there and shake his head and go, wow, what do you feel? See, my dad knew I felt something he wasn't feeling. And then he was like, I want to feel that. I want to know what my little six, seven-year-old boy can feel that I can't feel when this woman is coming into the room. Because I can feel it and he couldn't. He wanted it. He knew there was something in there. And from that point forward, I become a sponge to the Holy Ghost. I can sit in the meeting for 30 seconds when the person walks out and say, they're spiritually dead. Or they had something to give the body of Christ. I'm either in or out, right in there. I don't have a word of your word that comes out of their mouth. I can feel the anointing on their life. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I can feel it. I can feel it. I'd sit there and just feel the anointing. Just soak in that anointing. This is cool. But when Mrs. Coleman came in, we'd all be in worship. We would all be in the anointing. Then all of a sudden, it went like this. When she walked in, wow. she carried a whole other presence with her. Amen. Yes, she did. Meaning, five thousand people yep. in an auditorium, yep. worshiping God with all their hearts, worshiping God with everything that's in them, seeking God, hungry for the Lord, and one woman who's paid a price yeah. walks in. Jacks up the whole atmosphere. That's what I want. Yeah. I want that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. She said it cost her everything. Yeah. Mrs. Yeah. Coleman had wisdom, I'm telling you. She would tell you she wasn't a preacher because men stole that gift from her. The teachings of men. That's right. That's right. But she was anointed of God. Yeah. Because we could not understand what the scripture is saying. They would tell her she couldn't be a preacher. She was more of a preacher, yeah. more of a woman of God, more yeah. anointed than anybody I ever met in, my, in the first 20 years of my life. That's right. Yeah. That's right. If it wasn't for her, I don't even know if I'd be here today. That's right. But she taught me something. That God can do anything. Yeah. Yeah. You know how many kids I sat from in front of in Sunday school? We had one girl. I'd sit in front of her every week. Her eyes was like, their eyes were like that. They were crossed. And, and Mrs. Coleman one day called her out. She came up, she prayed for her eyes. And for, for the whole rest of the year, I just would walk in. She would sit right in front of me in Sunday school. I'd look at her eyes. Her eyes were always perfect. She'd look this way, it wouldn't cross. She'd look that way, it wouldn't cross. They were perfect all the time. Hallelujah. I was a little kid. I think he had polio or something. Had those little crutches. They went around his elbows. He was in my Sunday school. She prayed for him through those crutches off the club podium. Right. I watched a little boy walk in and play with him after that, running around with no more crushes. Do you think she affected his life? Do you think that she made an impact on his family and everybody that was around that little boy? Yes. Yes. And we all just don't have that. Yes. 
We don't have that. It takes people that have pressed in or willing to pay a price to get it. They've been through hell and back to get there. And I watch people mock her and mock her and mock her every week. I sit in meetings and hear people behind me. I don't believe that. And I don't believe this. And look the way she's standing. And she looks too provocative. And she was wearing a ball gown. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> One night this guy was behind me. Blah, 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 blah. On Sunday morning. He's just telling me all the stuff he didn't believe. Here I am, seven or eight years old. I turned around, looked at him, and I said, well, maybe you're just not a believer. <laughs> Bam! My mother hit me in the mouth. you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. <laughs>